the next kind of topic I wanted to discuss is another major stress in a lot of young people's lives is uh, sex, sexuality, finding a life partner. Um, uh, how does spirituality factor into having a life partner? Not that they should necessarily be spiritual, but how will this impact our decision of choosing someone or being with them? This is a difficult to answer because spirituality per se doesn't have any rules in mm -hmm. and regulations for this. There are no yama niyamas even in the yoga sutras of Patanjali about partners. Mm -hmm. So I can't say about this, but yeah. I think it can be looked at this way that um, a married life, for instance, mm -hmm. or a life where two people are in love and want to continue for a lifetime, it's decided by give and take, um, which means in the beginning of the relationship one should understand that you are not always right. I think spiritual maturity helps one to understand this. So therefore spiritual maturity is important. Because it makes you understand that you may not be always right. Mm -hmm. The other person may be right sometimes. At least you have to admit, give benefit of doubt. Mm -hmm. If I say I'm the right, nothing gets, then that marriage or that uh, living together is a disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is one of the reasons why I tell people that if you are married or you have a partner or you have a love affair, you want to live with somebody, please don't go and ask an unmarried person how to do it because the guy knows nothing about it. It's a completely different cup of tea. But then what happens? You go to the gurus who are generally not married and they we have this thing, oh, guru knows everything. He's omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. So he can't not give an answer because if he gives an answer, then he's not omni. He says, I don't know, then he becomes less omniscient. So they give wrong answers because they have never lived with a woman. They don't know what life is all about. Only people like me who have lived with women know how it works. <laughs> right? So, in fact, married life is wonderful because it's the best thing to clip your ego. Mm. If I go to a satsang and uh, there are lots of people sitting and they say, it's wonderful and so on, when I go home, if somebody is there to tell me, all that is fine, but heat the coffee before you drink, you know where you stand. Right? So, what I am trying to say is, um, what was your question I forgot? <laughs> I think I thought of my wife and forgot. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of how spirituality factors into decision yes. making and choosing. Just generally, I think people have a lot of stress of finding the right person and, you know, or maybe I'm growing spiritually, but yeah, yeah, all yeah. The, the guys I'm meeting I got are it. not. I got it. So now, now, don't think that all the guys in the world are spiritually oriented, okay? They may not be, but somebody you find who you think is spiritually oriented because he thinks on spiritual matters like you do, mm -hmm. may not be ideal also. Sure. Because the other guy who doesn't believe in all this may be a good guy. How do you know? So keep it open. Keep it open. Ah, and don't put your your uh, beliefs onto somebody's head. Mm -hmm. Let them think for themselves. I personally think that a total atheist and a fully involved atheist can live together as partners in married life as long as they don't step on each other's toes. Okay. I think so. It's possible. Okay. So, <laughs> what I mean to say is, what is required is sympathy. Mm -hmm openness of mind, mm -hmm. understanding, and to start with, to understand that you may not be always right. May not be. Maybe you are, maybe you are not. Mm -hmm. And the other person also has to think this way. Then everything is sorted out. Okay. So that's just, I think, great advice for people to keep in the back of their head while seriously, they're meeting people. Seriously, right? yes. Otherwise, you say, look, I am a Vedanti. I met somebody. This guy doesn't believe in anything. But he seems to be a good fellow. I say, value that good fellow business more than his Vedanta or non-Vedanta. I think that's great advice. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, 
uh, this question is from a, a younger man. I think it mm -hmm. <laughs> applies to young women as well. Mm -hmm. So hormones play a big and lust play a big role in our formative years. Do we need to overcome this, or should we be in the flow of it? Does it, you know, should this does this restrict us, or is this the path to finding the ultimate truth? Do you have any, um, or is there a way we can balance this? First of all, I don't like the word lust mm -hmm. because the word lust gives a bad picture of your normal response to your hormonal uprisings. Mm -hmm. So this lust is not a good word to be mm -hmm. used. I don't know who translated this into lust. Mm -hmm. It's been going on for long. I've seen this. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's normal when you're young to have hormonal uh, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes high, sometimes it's, mm -hmm. it's nothing wrong with that. But what you should understand is it usually doesn't stop there, it goes on to more complications. Uh, and it's all to do with the imagination. Mm -hmm. So you can kind of harness your imagination to more positive things most of the time. Mm -hmm. Not that this is less positive, but more constructive things most of the time then you have less time and involvement in this. But there is nothing wrong. Don't consider it as a sin. Okay. You understand? When you consider sin, it, it, many young people, because of their background and their traditions, they start, cons it, even among the Christians, or at least in India we don't have that problem. Uh, all the, uh, in the Christian theology, all children born on this earth are born in sin. Because Adam and Eve committed the first sin, and what is the first sin? They had sex. So it's classified as sin. Mm. On the other hand, uh, in another religion, it's a virtue to be always having sex with 15 to 16 wives, the other extreme. Right? So we have this wonderful thing in the Indian system that it's, sex is not looked down upon, but as a divine manifestation of the energies which have to be kept under a certain control so that they don't run riot. Especially if you go into the Tantra. Mm -hmm. People think that Tantra is origins. No. What Tantra is trying to say that most people cannot give up something unless they enjoy it. If you simply say, give up, they say, no, why should we give up? We don't know how it is. So they have this, Kula, Kularnava Tantra says, Bhoga o yoga yate, yoga through bhoga. It is misunderstood by people. What it actually means is that you enjoy and then you see what it is and then you get out. You don't get stuck there. It's not easy, but it's possible. Uh, so, and now, from the yogic point of view, the same energy which is used for constructive purposes as ojas, it is the same energy when it runs in a different direction that one has sex. Same energy. Ojas. Or just when it appears as rajas, uh -huh. then it is sex, physical. When it is purified and become sublime, then it becomes ojas. Actually, it is tej, rajas, tejas and ojas. Mm -hmm. hmm. So, per se, there is nothing wrong with the sexual instinct. It's that which keeps the world going. If there was no sex, there would be no more ch human beings. What I'm trying to say, don't label it as something dirty. Look at it as one of the manifestations of man's desire to expand. So, see, we can, if most people cannot expand and find out. So, how do they expand? The tendency to keep yourself infinite, which is built in the system, generally works by having kids. Mm -hmm. You may die, but that kid is surviving, so you're infinite. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Till that till that, uh, uh, what is that called, many generations, T till that stops, mm -hmm. you are infinite because what you have done is you are dead, what you have put your genes into somebody and that is going on living. So that is the man's innate desire to expand. Mm -hmm. In a physical way it happens when you have children. Mm -hmm. I am not saying whether you should have children, that is not the question here, I am just saying. So, this, I would say that the younger generation, since they are so exposed to sex and various things on TV, on internet, 
it's a, a foolish idea to tell them to cut everything off mm -hmm. and stay detached. It won't work. So they should be made interested in other things so that they balance the two. And then they realize that what the energy that is, you know, sexual energy is a very powerful energy. It can do anything. So if you can harness it to other uses, mm -hmm. not only here, mm -hmm. then it becomes a tremendous energy. So this has to be understood in some way. Um, and so and you mentioned something about Oja's breath and kind of transferring energies. Is there like, for example, if somebody's having sexual frustrations and they kind of maybe want to transcend mm -hmm. that to maybe put it in other ways but they're unable to, do you have any recommendations to maybe a asana or something, maybe a different way of thinking to kind of help to... Mm. I think it starts with a different way of thinking okay. and then you may look at some practice. Okay, so let's look at this. I hope it's all right to discuss, but um, the very act of sex, for instance, it's a culmination of something. Before that, there's a lot of imagination. Mm -hmm. a lot of, otherwise, it would be meaningless. Some people like only somebody like this, and somebody like something like you know. It, it and there is so much imagination. There's so much romantic thoughts. There's so many movie influences. There are many things behind this whole game that ultimately culminates in a physical, sexual act. And it differs with different people. You should keep this in mind. Okay. Now, ultimately, when the actual act takes place, well, in, in some scriptures it has been described as a sacrifice. In the Tantra, in, one of, in the Mahanirvana, it's considered to be a sacrifice where into the sacrificial altar of the female goes the sperm which is sacrificed by man. Nice uh, imagery, of course. And then, when both meet, on the physical side, a child may be produced or may not be produced, because there are rejections many times. But, in the actual act, in the ultimate culmination of the act, when, uh, what is called that happens, what is it called? Huh? Conception? Uh -uh. Orgasm. Oh. What's it called? When an actual orgasm happens, mm -hmm. see the whole thing of this imagination and romance and poetry, everything is finally to end there. Okay, so when this happens, for a second, both partners cannot even think. There's a state. There's nothing. Everything. It's almost like the beginning of a sneeze. You want to sneeze and yet it's wonderful that it's coming. I mean, <laughs> you can't think. You know what I mean? For that, even a split second, everything is... So it's for that that we seek. And for that there are so many embellishments and so many imagination depending on our tradition. So if this could be understood by young people, they would actually know the value of it and non-value of it, both. Mm -hmm. So it should start with that kind of thinking. Otherwise what happens is, the sexual op be becomes the only obsession and other things are not. Mm -hmm. If you can remove it from being the only obsession, mm -hmm. so that you give something else for them to understand, it starts with the idea actually, that for what we are looking for is that state when you actually have no voluntary thinking for the time being. Therefore you enjoy bliss. But it comes back in a second. Mm. And that's what the whole practice of meditation and so on aims at that. So if they get made to understand this, even theoretically, the idea that this is what it is ultimately, not just the imagination, but all the entire poems, poetry, romance, drama, everything has come from there. Mm -hmm. It culminates in that. <laughs> you get this? So, if this can be understood, then perhaps one can enjoy sex, but at the same time not get obsessed by it, mm -hmm. exclusively obsessed by it. There are other things also. Mm -hmm. This has to go... The problem is, when there is suppression, the obsession has more chances of increasing. Yes. On the other hand, you can't say that if you completely indulge, you can be free of it. That's been tested and it's not true. Mm -hmm. So, we have to strike a middle path. 
between the two. This, I think, can happen only with a little bit of dialogue and discussion with the okay. young. And they, they, they see this point. Okay. I think that's a great first. And once they begin to enjoy inside themselves a kind of feeling which need not necessarily be accompanied by the physical act of sex, then they are slowly free of it. Not by suppression. Mm -hmm. But by something else that's kind of taking Music. It. Something that really you enjoy without the act. Um, Which animals unfortunately cannot do. They can only do that. They cannot do anything else. <laughs> we having evolved, our frontal lobes having evolved so much, should be able to step out a bit from this. Learn to strike a balance hmm. between this and other. Yeah. And no suppression. If suppression is not the answer, but safety is important. Mm -hmm. Just because you are not wanting to suppress doesn't mean that you should allow yourself to be under all influences, then that is dangerous mm -hmm. in many ways. Mm -hmm. So, this is to be studied in a mature manner, that's what I'm trying to say. Okay. And my last question on this topic is uh, talking about uh, like homosexuality. Um, children who are gay or lesbian, bisexual, transsexual, um, they deal with stress, depression, they have higher rates of suicide. And a large part of that is because society doesn't accept them and many religions do not accept them. Um, not the Hindu religion. Many religions may be, but certainly not Hinduism. I mean, so in, I, in its open aspect. Right. And I was just wondering, you know, what do the ancient teachings and scriptures, the Vedanta, maybe the Bhagavad Gita, Upanishads, what do they say about this? And do you have a message to maybe kids who are dealing with yeah, this. Yeah, you know what, I think this is built into the genes. Nobody can be blamed for that. Mm -hmm. They may look odd to us, people who don't have that genetic problem to us, but they are like that, okay. Now as far as the ancient Indian culture is concerned, Shiva himself is depicted, the, the uh, um, Mahadev, the greatest of the Devas, depicted very often as Ardhanarishwara half man, half woman. So, and in, in, in now it is different, but in ancient India people had a respect for such people. Very often they, they looked up as something different from others. Now, because they are not looked after, they have become uh, beggars on the street. In India, I am saying, not here. So, and if you go into uh, the Puranas and so on. In many instances, many stories, once Arjuna became a eunuch in the Mahabharata mm -hmm. for some time and then he came back. So, it's not as if, personally I think they should also be accorded a certain respect and there is nothing irreligious in giving them their place. In fact, it is very pro-religious to give them their place. And I am of the opinion that after some time you'll have transgenders working, doing the work that men and women have done before and traditionally. They would also do that. Mm -hmm. I have nothing against them per se. In fact, I have found that some of them are very good people, very nice people. Why are you hating them? I don't understand. They may be not like you, they're different from you, but why do you hate them? For what? That is because of our, uh, of the, some, partly because of religion. Partly because of, I think, discrimination because you are not like them. They are different. Personally, I think young people who are leaning towards this, they should not be discouraged. They should. Be. It is natural. If you discourage them and try to put strictures on them, it will end up in depression and suicide. Why don't you let them live? And having said that, every human being has a female and a male element in them. We know this, it's biologically known that their males have female hormones and females have male hormones. There is testosterone in the woman, but slight. There is uh, estrogen in man, but less. When they go a little bit unbalanced, then somebody is like a transgender. When it is more this and less that, then you have decided your sex. Mm. So, it doesn't matter really. I personally have nothing. Again, I think if young people 
want to do it, they should not be stopped because that's their way of evolution. And for somebody who is... Ayapa, okay. Yes, now, yeah, yeah, if you could tell some stories, I think maybe someone who's watching this is who is... No, you have read my novel, Shunya? Yes. I've given the story of Ayapa, who everybody goes and... Yeah. Now, Ayapa was born, it's a very funny story, that when Mahavishnu became Mohiti, during the Samudra Manthan, Shiva fell in love. And she ran and he ran, and then they had a child, and that is Ayapa. And we worship that Ayapa. It's a transgender union, which doesn't work nowadays. It's an ancient time, it has worked probably. I don't know, maybe it's a story. All I'm trying to illustrate is, why do we blame them? And I think for those who are watching, who are uh, maybe experiencing this, I think maybe they can turn to these Puranas and not feel like they're an outsider, yeah. that their story is also absolutely. being told. I think absolutely. that gives, can give people a lot of strength. Yeah, give to Shiv Purana, go and look at Shiva as Ardha Narishwara. And it's very beautifully done in the sculptures. One side is male and the other is female. Yeah. In fact, creative people have a little bit of female instinct in them, even if they are men. You know, many women also have a little bit of male streak in them. They make good sportsmen, sports people. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> yeah, and even like as you say, we all have different births. If you believe in it, we could have been born a man or no, a woman absolutely, before. Absolutely, absolutely. That means that something has to be worked out. So you're here. So what? Yeah. Why do you blame them? Okay.